Let's open with prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for uh, this time together. And as always, we uh, thank you for the blessing of your appointed times, uh, one of which is the Sabbath day, which will be upon us soon. And we pray, Father, you bless our study of your word this evening and our fellowship together. This we pray as your humble servants. Amen. Okay, um, we're on Genesis 7. I love the first... 11 or so chapters of Genesis. They're, they're, uh, they're about just some amazing things, and this, this worldwide flood is another one. And I would encourage everybody, uh, just believe what his word says, because it's all true. <clears throat> um, look at Genesis 7, verse 1. Then Yahweh said to Noah, Enter the ark, you and all your household, for you alone I have seen to be righteous before me at this time. The ark was constructed, the animals were assembled, and Grandpa Methuselah had either just died or he was on his deathbed. Now Noah here, interesting description of Noah. He's called righteous. Now that word, what does that word mean, righteous? Means you're right, yeah. Yeah, um... If, here's the deal, though. If, there hasn't, if there's no Torah, then there's no sin. Right? If there's no sin, there's no righteousness. Because then you're avoiding the sin. So the only, the only conclusion we can come to is he is called righteous because there is sin and there is Torah. And that's why there's a destruction coming on the world. I mean, if there's no Torah, therefore there's no sin imputed. This destruction of the world is unjust. <clears throat> well, this is a, a strong proof that the Torah was known by the people from the very beginning that Noah is called righteous. We read in uh, Deuteronomy 6, verse 25, and it will be righteousness for us if we're careful to observe all this commandment before Yahweh our Elohim, just as he commanded us. What's the other way you can be called righteous? Yeah, I don't know. There isn't one. <laughs> yeah, trick question. <clears throat> um, people say, well, when I believe in Jesus and have faith in him, then his righteousness is imputed to me. You heard that? Come on, you had your church hat on at one time, didn't you? What did that mean? Right, you have no idea. <laughs> Sounded good, yeah. It's a good way to uh, be declared righteous without really getting too involved. You know, that's good. Don't want to get too involved, do you? We see, uh, but this is just uh, righteousness by definition in Scripture is this. Being careful to observe all his commandments. 1 John 2 verse 29 says, If you know that he is righteous, you know that everyone also who practices righteousness is born of him. Practices righteousness. Notice it doesn't say everyone who is perfect is born of him. It says everyone who practices righteousness. Now, in this mortal flesh that we have right now, we are not going to achieve perfection. And we know that. But does that mean we shouldn't do our best to do so? Well, we should. Be obedient to our Heavenly Father. That's what we want to be. <clears throat> what do, what's our practice? That's what's important. What's your practice? Not, are you perfect? We flunk that. 1 John uh, 3, verses 6 and 7, No one who abides in him sins. No one who sins has seen him or knows him. Little children, let no one deceive you. The one who practices righteousness is righteous just as he is righteous. Do you want to be like uh, Yeshua the Messiah? you want to be like him? Practice righteousness. Follow his Torah. Then you'll get to know him. And you'll get to know his heavenly father. Genesis 7, verses 2 and 3. You shall take with you of every clean animal by sevens, a male and his female, and of the animals that are not clean, two, a male and his female, 
Also of the birds of the sky by sevens, male and female, keep, to keep offspring alive on the face of all the earth. Now, most Christian theologians and scholars believe that man has not yet been told what constitutes a clean animal. Now, Dr. Henry Morris, who passed away years ago, uh, he wrote a book called The Genesis Record. It's a very good book. Uh, and he, was a, he started the big modern creation movement in the world back in the early 70s by writing that book. And, uh, but he's a Baptist. You see, you gotta, <laughs> when he's a Baptist, you can't admit, you can't admit certain things. Like being, following the Torah is the right thing to do. You can't admit that. Um, you can't admit that the Torah was around uh, at the time of creation and that it was the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Someone commented on the YouTube page. The Torah is not the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And I'm no longer subscribed to your videos. Well, he hurt my feelings. If you hurt my feelings, I delete your comment. <laughs> Actually, he didn't really hurt my feelings, but I did delete his comment. <laughs> I don't mind discussing those things. Well, what if, um, tell me why it's not. Why would the tree of knowledge of good and evil not be the Torah? I mean, how do you have knowledge of good, what's good and what's evil? What tells you that? I, I don't know of another source. Okay? So, either they mislabeled it, or I'm right. But the, Dr. Henry Morris says, maybe... Maybe God let Noah pick which animals are clean. Maybe he let Noah declare his favorite animals to be clean ones. And he got seven of all those. Uh, I, I just thought, oh, Dr. Henry, how, how could you? <laughs> That's silly. Uh, here's the thing. There's no hint that this is a special revelation to Noah. No, there's no, there's no hint there at all. It's like it was common knowledge. All right, I want you to get two of every animal and seven of every clean one. He didn't say, excuse me, what? What do you mean clean? What, wash them off first? What? No, there's none of that. It's, it's stated as if Noah fully comprehended the comment. The logical reason for Noah to have known which animals were clean, which animals were unclean, is to already have knowledge of Elohim's Torah, which the world already had and rejected so, as mentioned earlier, it makes more sense that Elohim's law predated Sinai uh, just because the formal writing of the covenant occurred at Sinai, that doesn't mean it wasn't revealed much, much, much earlier, like at the very beginning. How did Abraham know to follow Elohim's commandments, laws, statutes? Genesis 26, verses 4 and 5. <clears throat> this is Elohim speaking to Isaac, his son. Uh, Abraham had already passed. And he says, I'll multiply your descendants as the stars of heaven and will give your descendants all these lands. And by your descendants, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed because Abraham obeyed me and kept my charge, my commandments, my statutes, and my Torah. How did he obey it if it wasn't there? How did Abraham know to teach his children to follow the way of Elohim as commanded in the Torah? In uh, Genesis 18, verse 19, we're told, For I have chosen him in order that he may command his children and his household after him to keep the way of Yahweh by doing righteousness and justice, in order that Yahweh may bring upon Abraham what he has spoken about him. Uh, woo, there's, there's a term in there that's interesting. He commanded his children to keep the way of Yahweh. Well, what would that be? What's the way of Yahweh? Well, that's his Torah. That's just what it is. <clears throat> how did Abraham know what it is? Well, because it's, the Torah was there. That's how. <clears throat> how is this blessing to Abraham almost identical to the one given a thousand years later in Psalm 128? Starting at verse 1, how blessed is everyone who fears Yahweh, who walks in his ways. When you shall eat of the fruit of your hands, you will be happy and it will be well with you. Your wife shall be like a fruitful vine within your house, your children like olive plants around your table. 
Behold, for thus shall the man be blessed who fears Yahweh. Yahweh bless you from Zion. May you see the prosperity of Jerusalem all the days of your life. Indeed, may you see your children's children. Shalom be upon Israel. Abraham is given the blessing of many descendants for following Elohim's statutes and his ways. Others are given the same blessing for the same acts thousands of years later. What's the difference? It makes sense that Abraham was doing the same things that Elohim's law, the Torah, calls for. I uh, mentioned this a couple months ago, I guess, or at least a month ago. How did Joseph know that having relations with Potiphar's wife was a sin against Elohim? How did he know that? <clears throat> In Genesis 39, starting at verse 7, And it came about after these events that his master's wife looked with desire at Joseph. And she said, Lie with me. But he refused and said to his master's wife, Behold with me here, my master does not concern himself with anything in the house, and he's put all that he owns in my charge. There's no one greater in this house than I, and he's withheld nothing from me except you, because you're his wife. How then could I do this great evil and sin against Elohim? He didn't say sin against Potiphar. All sin is sin against the Father. Understand that David said that, against you and you only I sinned what David wrote in the Psalms. Why is that? Well, the reason being is it's not my Torah. It's not your Torah. If you break the Torah, it's the Father's instructions we're breaking, not mine and yours. So a sin in breaking that, those instructions are a sin against him. Uh, how did Joseph know that? Well, how did he know adultery is wrong? <clears throat> If there wasn't already a thou shalt not commit adultery in the books. Uh, how did Abel know what a proper sacrifice was? And how did he know to do it of the first of the flock? Like he said he did. Uh, amazing things. And to attribute these things to luck, intuition, or special revelation is not called for in any of these examples I gave you. It's never called for at all. So it's much more likely that Elohim's word, including his Torah, pre-existed man. John 1, verses 1 and 2. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with Elohim, and the word was Elohim. He was in the beginning with Elohim. Uh, see, every once in a while, I'm, I'm foolish enough to make a comment on Facebook. Only fools do that me um, someone we were talking about who Yeshua was and I said well he's the uh, he's the Torah of the father made flesh and I posted John 1 verses 1 and 2 no that's the Greek word logos that means that means uh, spoken word not the Torah uh, what <laughs> uh, Okay, the word of the Father includes the Torah. How does that sound? No, no, don't believe so. Well, okay, I guess you win. <laughs> I, I don't know how to, this fool knows when to quit sometimes, so I did. You know, it's obvious from texts in Genesis and others that Torah was revealed to mankind long before Sinai. Especially since we know that Elohim was still in communication with man after sin came into the world. Elohim still talked with Cain, Abel, Noah, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and others. <clears throat> Let's look at verse 4 of Genesis 7. For after seven more days I'll send rain on the earth for forty days and forty nights, and I'll blot out from the face of the land every living thing that I've made. Seven-day countdown, it could have several purposes. Uh, give Noah last-minute preparation time, get the animals in the stalls and all that jazz. One last warning to the people of that day. This may also have been, it could, this is also a possibility. What if Methuselah died then and they have a seven-day mourning period? Uh, they had that with Joseph, by the way. 
in Genesis 50, verse 10, I mean for Jacob. And when they came to the threshing floor of Atad, which is beyond the Jordan, they lamented there with a very great and sorrowful lamentation. And he observed seven days mourning for his father. So that's Joseph mourning for Jacob. Could, that could be the case. Methuselah may have just uh, kicked the bucket after 969 years or whatever. Verse 5 of Genesis 7, And Noah did, all, did according to all that Yahweh had commanded him. So Noah was to do as Elohim commanded, make a final break with the world around him. He placed himself totally in Elohim's mercy. And Noah obeyed Elohim without hesitation. Verse 6, Now Noah was 600 years old when the flood of water came upon the earth. So Noah, he'd been working on that ark now for what appears to be a hundred years. Verses 7 through 9, And then Noah and his sons and his wife and his sons' wives with him entered the ark because of the water of the flood. Of clean animals and animals that are not clean and birds and everything that creeps on the ground, there went into the ark to Noah by twos, male and female, as Elohim had commanded Noah. So each animal is represented by a male and a female. Uh, notice there wasn't a spectrum of sex back then. You know, man was primitive then, not intelligent like we are today. We think there's a spectrum of 738 different sexes. Excuse me, genders. Yeah, genders. <clears throat> um... Yeah, poor old primitive man. Only thought there was men and women, male and female. <clears throat> and once again, though, Noah does as Elohim commands. Verses 10 and 11 of Genesis 7. It came about after the seven days that the water of the flood came upon the earth. In the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, on the 17th day of the month, on the same day all the fountains of the great deep burst open and the floodgates of the sky were opened. You know, notice this is a precise date, which is very interesting. We don't know what year it was. But, so we don't know exactly when it happened. But a date is given to it, a specific date is given to it, to signify this is a definite historical event. And it is not to be taken lightly. The description given here is undoubtedly cataclysmic. Uh, it's interesting to, de to determine what is being described here. It's, it's a likely description of some kind of a volcanic eruption. And if that's the case, then we're probably looking at a worldwide catastrophe, including underwater volcanic activity that would heat up the oceans to the extent the superheated water would quickly evaporate and become the source of that immense rainfall that we see for 40 days and 40 nights. Um, if we're looking at worldwide volcanic, it says, it says the great fountains of the deep burst open. That's... Uh, that's probably the case. <clears throat> now, it's even possible such worldwide volcanic activity was caused by an asteroid or a comet striking the Earth large enough to shift the crust of the Earth. And that would cause all this stuff. And that also could be why Elohim could give them a particular date that this was going to happen. Because of physics. And something like that being 120 years away. <clears throat> now, this type of thing would collapse the subterranean water conduits that previously caused the mist to come up from the ground. Genesis 2, verse 6, but a mist used to rise from the earth and water the whole surface of the ground. Now, I, I don't know if you're aware of this, but it's estimated that there is as much water beneath the mantle of the earth as there is in all the oceans co uh, combined in the world. Now, if you, um, if you look, we have these chains of volcanoes in different parts of the world. The Aleutian Arc volcanoes are very interesting. And I mean, it's like it's all, everything broke right there at that point. You've heard of the Ring of Fire, the volcanoes. Well, look how much of the Earth that covers. Okay? So this type of thing, it's very likely that's what it was was uh, enormous volcanic eruption 
worldwide. It explains virtually everything. <clears throat> and people, people think things like, well, gee, I'd like to find the Garden of Eden. Well, folks, uh, the, the crust of the earth was pretty much turned over. Okay, it's, it's pretty much destroyed. You're not going to find anything from before the flood. Verse 12, and the rain fell upon the earth for 40 days and 40 nights. The rain continued for the length of time Elohim said it would in verse 4. Verse 13, on the very same day, Noah and Shem and Ham and Japheth, the sons of Noah and Noah's wife and the three wives of his sons with them entered the ark. They and every beast after its kind and all the cattle after their kind and every creeping thing that creeps on the earth after its kind and every bird after its kind, all sorts of birds. So they went to the ark to Noah by twos of all flesh in which was, been, was the breath of life. And those that entered, male and female of all flesh, entered as Elohim had commanded him, and Yahweh closed it behind him. The authors are repeating what it said a few verses ago. It's emphasizing the historicity of the event. Um, okay, now I've heard, I've heard people say, and there are people that believe this, that the scripture is written from two different points of view from the Yahwist point of view and the Elohist point of view. And when things are repeated like that, it was alternating the two views. Okay, who else has heard that? Okay, good, thank you. Only one person was wasting the time to study that like I did. <laughs> but I, I studied it too so I could learn it. Uh, why is something like this repeated? I mean, he just said it. Oh, what, what's that? Two? Oh, you're saying that they're trying to establish the matter. Is that what you're trying to say? Okay. Uh, Deuteronomy 19, verse 15, a single witness shall not rise up against a man on account of any iniquity or any sin which he's committed. On the evidence of two or three witnesses, a matter shall be confirmed. John 8, verse 17, even in your Torah, it's been written, the testimony of two men is true. Uh, virtually everything in Scripture is repeated twice. Everything. Almost everything. Um, why do you think there are four Gospels? Because we're really going to establish this matter. That's why. We're really going to establish the matter. <clears throat> it's an emphasis for our good. It says here, Elohim shut them in. This provided final assurance to the passengers. They were under the will of Elohim and under his protection. And it's a good thing, because they needed it. Verses 17 and 18, Then the flood came upon the earth for forty days, and the water increased and lifted up the ark so that it rose above the earth. And the water prevailed and increased greatly upon the earth, and the ark floated on the surface of the water. These verses in the remainder of chapter 7 tell us without a doubt that this flood is a worldwide event. And here are some examples of this in this text. The wording of the entire record is obviously an attempt to describe a worldwide flood. If it was a local flood, Elohim would have told Noah to migrate somewhere else instead of spending 100 years building a boat. <clears throat> uh, also, expressions implying a universal flood occur more than 30 times in Genesis 6 through Genesis 9. Uh, the Hebrew word used to de describe this event is only used to describe this event. It's not used in any other kind of flooding thing or anything like that in Scripture. Uh, the ark was huge. We talked about that last week. It was huge. It was far too large to be carried off by a local flood. But it was plenty big to hold two of every species, which wasn't even necessary. We talked about that. Two of every kind would have been easy. <clears throat> Um, as far as uh, ancient accounts of a flood story, there are at least 270 civilizations that have in their history some kind of a flood account. 270 of them that have a flood account in their history. Why is that? because they all came from the same place. They all came from the Tower of Babel, 
which was not that long after the flood. And they all were told of it and all remembered it. That's why. We're going to go over one of those. We're going to go over here after we go over Genesis 7. I brought the, uh, the ancient flood story from the Aborigines in Australia. The Aborigines, you say? Yes, I say the Aborigines. We're going to see how similar that story is actually to the scripture itself. And it came from their, their historical uh, verbal accounts that were passed down from generation to generation. <clears throat> Yeshua Messiah and the Apostle Peter verified that this is a worldwide flood. We read in Matthew 24, starting in verse 37, For the coming of the Son of Man will be just like the days of Noah. For as in those days which were before the flood, they were eating and drinking, they were marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark, and they did not understand until the flood came and took them all away, so shall the coming of the Son of Man be. In 2 Peter 3, verse 6, Peter wrote, Through which the world at that time was destroyed, being flooded with water. Go back to Genesis 7, verses 19 and 20. And the water prevailed more and more upon the earth, so that all the high mountains everywhere under the heavens were covered. The water prevailed 15 cubits higher, and the mountains were, were covered. <clears throat> um, the event is recorded as if it's an eyewitness event. Other evidences that indicate that it's a worldwide flood are this. It said it prevailed over the highest mountain by 15 cubits. That's 22 feet. Um, why 22 feet, you wonder? Well, first of all, the mountains were probably made at this time. All right? The mountains that existed in that day were probably not near what we see now. But when you take the crust of the earth and crack it open, that forms mountain ranges and things like that. But why 15 cubits or 22 feet? You know what? Yeah, uh, that's probably the submerged depth of the ark. 22 feet at the max. So, <clears throat> just interesting. The elevation of Mount Ararat is 17,000 feet. <laughs> well, that didn't mean that floodwaters were at elevation 17,022. No, the, the mountains were formed at that time. And they weren't, they weren't the size they are now. It says all the high mountains were covered under all the heavens. That's worldwide. Verse 21. And all flesh that moved on the earth, earth perished, birds and cattle and beasts and every swarming thing that swarms upon the earth and all mankind. Okay, another thing. It says all flesh died that moved upon the earth. If it's not a worldwide flood, it's a false statement. It says every man died which was the whole idea. You know, anthropologists do agree that the whole earth was once populated by man at a date earlier than 4,000 years. A local flood wouldn't have reached every man, but this did. Verses 22 and 23. Of all that was on the dry land, all in whose nostrils was the breath of the spirit of life died. Thus he blotted out every living thing that was upon the face of the land, from man to animals to creeping things, to the birds of the sky. They were blotted out from the earth. Only Noah was left, together with those that were with him in the ark. If uh, one believes scripture, then there is a host of irrefutable evidence that this was a worldwide catastrophe. For example, the moose deer, which is a native of America, has been found buried in Ireland. Elephant remains, native of Asia and Africa, have been discovered in the midst of England. Crocodile remains, natives of the Nile, have been found in the heart of Germany. Shellfish, never known in any but the American seas, along, along with the entire skeletons of whales, have been found in the most inland counties of England. This passage says evil man was blotted out from the earth, and it would appear... They're blotted out forever, and they'll be judged accordingly. In Psalm 9, verse 5, you have rebuked the nations. You have destroyed the wicked. You blotted out their name forever and ever. Psalm 69, verse 28, we read, May they be blotted out of the book of life, and may they not be recorded with the righteous. And the last verse, 
Genesis 7, verse 24, And the water prevailed upon the earth 150 days. A local flood would not keep rising for 120 days. <clears throat> flood waters do not recede enough to permit the occupants to leave the ark for over one year. So that's how long the receding of the water took. Uh, Dr. Henry Morris, in that book I told you about the Genesis record, he lists a hundred biblical and scientific reasons for believing the flood was worldwide. There's lots of reasons to believe it. Um, you know, I told you there's 270 civilizations that have a, uh, a flood story in their, in their history. Um, to me, that's kind of irrefutable proof that it happened in some manner. Um, the evolutionist, though, says, no, it's just proof that everyone made up a flood story. Everyone made up their own flood story. I, uh, if there's something common in the historical traditions of ancient people of different civilizations around the world, that's a commonality. That's not... Uh, that's not just coincidence. That's impossible. I, I, I hate coincidences anyway. <clears throat> Any questions on Genesis 7? Yeah. Uh, of what was killed? The sea life? The sea life? No, it doesn't because they, uh, they survived rather well. It was still their environment. Granted, it was turbulent. A lot of the sea life would have died in this. And also, it doesn't mention anything about insects. Insect, it says those that breathe through the nostril. Insects don't breathe through the nostrils. They breathe through their, through their skin. But we can't get rid of them anyway. <laughs> okay? You know, uh, I'm, sure that, I'm sure that at least two cockroaches jumped on there sometime. Can't get rid of those things. I saw one last night. Sucker was bigger than my thumb. I couldn't get him. Well, those are the fastest ones, too. But, yeah, uh, the sea life didn't need to be preserved because it was out there. Um, and insects, they, they, they will cling to what, they'll, they'll stay on the water and do just fine. So, yeah, anything else? Anybody? Yeah. Oh, that could be too. Good point. Can't keep going to the high ground. Yeah. And, and the waters, and to, on top of that, probably couldn't have stayed there anyway because the water was turbulent. Uh, with it rising and lowering like, like, like it took uh, a year to recede. My gosh. That water. Yeah, the, the Grand Canyon, by the way, uh, we may look at that. Shoot, next new moon we have. I might do a creation versus evolution discussion. And I haven't done that in years in here. Uh, that's always fun. That's a really a fun one. I, I used to moderate a creation science message board. And I told the guys, I said, you have, and there were evolutionists that had PhDs from every, uh, every different field. There were uh, PhDs in thermodynamics, uh, PhDs in biology, PhDs in geology and geological engineering that were against us. And they all would post these things. Remember when message boards were a big thing? Yeah. Yeah, some of you remember. <clears throat> some won't. But uh, I told them, if you can convince me of this, I'm on your side. You, you show me scientific evidence of this, I'm with you. And after discussing it with them for about three years, I... I well, before that, but I decided uh, you guys got nothing. They have nothing. It's all smoke and mirrors. It's all smoke and mirrors. A, few, uh, a new set of terminology that you have to study their fields to understand, but it doesn't prove anything. It doesn't prove anything. Yeah. Um, the next punishment is fire. Do you think the sea life will be scared again? <clears throat> you see, that's a, that's a good question. He said it's going to be by fire. Peter really is the one that writes about that. Um, yeah, but the judgment by fire is, uh, is that lake is what he's talking about. 
And that is spoken of actually in the, uh, in the last chapter of Isaiah. And I'll just show you here. And, and I, it, it proved to me, at least in my mind, there's no such thing like you're going to go to hell and burn and suffer for eternity. That's what's taught in Christianity. That's not true. That's not true. Um, in Isaiah 66, just right at the end of the, the whole book, verses 23 and 24, this is another thing. Verse 23, It shall be from new moon to new moon and Sabbath to Sabbath. All mankind will come to bow down before me, says Yahweh. New moon to new moon and Sabbath to Sabbath before Messiah. New moon to new moon and Sabbath to Sabbath after he returns. Why not in between? Why not in between the time he came the first time and came the second? If it was done away with after that first time he came. Why is it at the, for eternity it's going to be from Sabbath to Sabbath and new moon to new moon that all mankind's going to bow down before me? He says, and they'll go forth and look on the corpses of men who have transgressed against me. For their worm will not die, their fire will not be quenched, there'll be an abhorrence to all mankind. Keep in mind it says the worm will not die, the fire will not be quenched. Well, the worm will not die, but it says we're going to look on the corpses. Okay, we're going to look at the dead. They're probably not going to be consumed. Why? A reminder. A reminder of the sin of man. <clears throat> and that's what I think the judgment by fire is. It's not, uh, the, when it says uh, there's going to be a new heavens and a new earth, this, that doesn't mean this one is going to be scrapped and, and he's going to make another one. What it means is it's going to be a world that is governed by the Torah with the judge sitting on top of a mountain in Jerusalem. Okay? That's going to be, that's going to be the new heavens and new earth. It's actually going to be governed by righteousness. That's why swords are going to be beaten down into plowshares. It's going to make men busy making things instead of destroying each other.